This 1998 article summarizes Deanna Hall's work previously published as her 1995 master's thesis in sociology, Resource Mobilization in Scientology, published by the University of Alberta in 1995. Hall continued to work as a researcher at the university after completing the thesis and publishing this article from it. She went on to complete a PhD in sociology in 2003. Rather than pursuing an academic track, she embarked on a career as a data analyst and manpower specialist for a variety of private firms and governments rising into senior management positions with a series of employers. Her earlier master's research looked at the Scientology New Religious Movement as just another social movement. Social movement theory is clear about one thing. To succeed, any movement needs to find a way to generate resources. Paul discovered that the Scientologists had hit upon a unique new way to generate the resources they needed. See what you think of this innovative approach. Some new religious movements have become considerably more sophisticated than others in their strategies for recruiting new members. Paul's article provides a fascinating case in point with a look at the Church of Scientology and their very clever, innovative approach to this important matter of growing the religion. Some religious groups still follow the unscientific and inefficient frontal assault strategy, assuming that since their religious beliefs are the most important thing in their own lives, this means that these beliefs are the most important selling point to share with other potential new recruits. Military strategists have known for centuries that direct frontal assault is one of the least effective and least imaginative strategic possibilities, to be avoided unless there's no other option. But apparently many new religious movements just getting started have no clue about such questions. The Scientologists do not fall into that trap. To understand the general problem of recruiting new members into any group, it can be helpful to review some of the basic premises of a branch of sociology dealing with social movements of any type, from the environmental movement to the anti-abortion movement, from mothers against drunk drivers to the Church of Scientology. The study of social movements has assembled some general observations about how all such organizations survive and grow, usually called resource mobilization theory. The first logical step of resource mobilization theory starts with some general population that forms the potential universe from which your new group might be able to recruit some new members. We sometimes refer to this background population as the general public, or even as the bystander public, giving a sort of image of lots of people standing around on sidewalks, watching the parade of your social movement passing by in the street or something. The key question is how to bring some of those people off the sidewalk to get them moving down the street as part of your parade. How can a group gain new adherents? The other side of this coin, however, reminds us that for almost any social movement that might spring up, and particularly for a new religious movement, which usually is proposing to change something about the existing religious landscape in society, there are also going to be some people standing around on that sidewalk who are really quite upset about your parade and wish there were some way to revoke your permit and disperse all your marchers to shut down the whole business. These opponents are also part of the public or population, and you will have to deal with them if they decide to get in the street to object to your parade. The next category of people in resource mobilization theory turn out to be the key to both the problem of recruiting adherents and the challenge of neutralizing your opponents. These people may have started out as just adherents who liked the message or purpose of your social movement, but they have gotten more involved. You might say they've gone from being passive members to being active members of the group. They contribute time, energy, money, and other resources to support your goals. These contributions are crucial both for attracting new adherents and for counteracting the bad publicity that your opponents may spread about you. In fact, we can trace the chain of connections that allows any social movement to survive and thrive. To get more participants as adherents or believers, you have to offer them some kind of rewards. This doesn't necessarily mean tangible rewards like wages or prizes. Rewards can be as intangible as friendship. They can include peanut butter sandwiches, 
or a group activity like a picnic or a trip to the beach. And of course, when people tell you that you are important to the group and that you are a wonderful person doing the right thing with your life, that's a reward too. All of these rewards require resources. Somebody has to buy the peanut butter to make the sandwiches. Telling new members how wonderful and important they are takes time and energy that has to be committed to the cause by existing constituent members. Just as there are many possible ways to reward potential recruits and new members, there are equally many kinds of resources that have to be committed to deliver these rewards. People familiar with this kind of activity will quickly and pretty much unanimously agree with the old saying that it is easy to get people to give you money compared with trying to get them to give you their personal time and commitment. But all such resources have to flow into your social movement, your new religion, at a steady basis if you want it to survive and flourish. This is where the tip of the pyramid of resource mobilization theory fits into the model. The organizers, the social movement or entrepreneurs who work like mad to motivate the group's constituents, to convince them to give money and time and effort. Without those resources, you can't offer new recruits any rewards, and you've got nothing to counteract the hostile influence of your group's opponents. Resource mobilization theory turns out to be a framework for describing the effectiveness of entrepreneurs who see an opportunity to create something new and who go after it. If they're good at this effort, they will recruit some adherents and mobilize some of these into active constituents working to build the movement. Together, these organizers and constituents will continue to recruit other new members and at the same time effectively block their opposition and neutralize its negative influences. You can analyze any social movement, including a new religion, through this resource mobilization lens and see how and why it fails or succeeds. With this in mind, we can examine Hall's evidence about how this works for the Church of Scientology. Like any religious movement, the Church of Scientology faced a problem over half a century ago of recruiting new members. Everybody's familiar with the direct missionary approach taken by many groups, ranging from established religious bodies like the Southern Baptists with their mission trips all over the world, to the Mormon missions undertaken by young adults in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But the Scientologists went these groups one better, developing an indirect approach that combined recruitment of new believers with a clever arrangement that actually generated a major revenue stream for their organization. All social movements from political parties or environmental groups to new religious movements would like to attract not only new members, but new members with high status and lots of money. Such new members can contribute both their social status and their economic clout to strengthen and further extend the group's outreach. The care with which Scientology planned their approach shows this selectivity since they aimed specifically at professionals working in the lucrative health services industry. They wanted to recruit doctors, dentists, and other high-status professionals in health services. But these highly educated, dynamic professionals probably would not be very receptive to urgent but rather mystical otherworldly messages about sin, salvation, heaven, and hell. The Scientologists had to ask themselves, what do these health professionals really need? And the answer they came up with was not a religious message at all, at least not on the surface. It was a message about the bottom line, about managing the complex practical, financial, and organizational problems that come with success in setting up any kind of medical practice. These professionals might be the best in the world at taking out your appendix or your wisdom teeth, but many of them have little interest in or ability at handling payroll taxes for their employees, keeping records on their patients, and wisely managing all the money that flows through their practices. The Scientologists decided to start with these problems rather than with a direct religious message. Now, of course, they were not the first people to figure out that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit to be found in the healthcare industry for business management experts, particularly in the United States, where we as citizens spend many times more of our gross national product per person on healthcare than in any other country on earth. Any kind of business related to this sector is practically a license to print money. 
some of the biggest, slickest, and most aggressive accounting and management firms in the world are centered squarely on the U.S. healthcare sector. The Scientologists realized quickly that they could not go head to head with these big boys and compete for the management of major hospitals, healthcare maintenance organizations, or the largest diversified medical groups of surgeons and other specialists. They needed to identify niche markets within the healthcare sector that typically involved small or solo practices, little fishes that would slip through the nets of the giant accounting and management firms. The front organization that they decided to call Practice Management Consulting looked carefully for these small-scale providers, particularly focused in the case of the Canadian market, described in Hall's article, on veterinarians, dentists, podiatrists, chiropractors, and other practitioners working on their own rather than integrated into larger business organizations that could solve many of their management problems for them. You can tell that PMC is related to the Scientologists because they use the Scientology eight-pointed star as their logo, a dead giveaway or signal if you're in the know about such things. These solo professionals felt the financial pressures of the late 20th century acutely. Paul shows us how competition increased as more people entered these lucrative fields at the same time that paperwork and bureaucracy associated with increasingly complicated and expensive government and insurance claims were expanding exponentially. These professionals were singularly unprepared to deal with such challenges. Paul's original research documents that the percentage of their professional medical training devoted to practical issues of managing a business typically was only in the single digits, maybe two or three percent of their education. They had no idea how to deal with taxes, investments, insurance claims, or even computerized scheduling and billing. They really needed help. This is the void that Scientology offered to fill with their practice management consulting. A dentist in Winnipeg or a chiropractor in Ottawa would get a card or a letter in the mail from PMC, or a representative would make a sales call in the office with information about how they could help to make the business more profitable, run more smoothly, and provide better care to patients at the same time. PMC was staffed by people with conventional training in accounting and business management techniques, but this standard information had been repackaged into an unusual new format based on the voluminous writings of L. Ron Hubbard, the guy who founded Scientology in the early 1950s in California. Whenever PMC signed a contract to provide these repackaged business instructions and management training to another healthcare practice, Scientology headquarters skimmed off 10% of that income. So even before the possibility of recruiting any new members to the group, this clever strategy was generating revenue for the Church of Scientology. But who was this L. Ron Hubbard person? There are many excellent biographies out there, aside from the worshipful propaganda issued by the Scientologists themselves. There's even a quite extensive Wikipedia entry on him, with lots of documentation of his demonstrated brilliant but erratic mind early in life, his youthful emergence as a successful writer of pulp novels, first dealing with cowboys in the Old West, and then later with a raft of lurid science fiction tales. He had a brief, disastrous career in the U.S. Navy during World War II, and finally patched together a new cult philosophy called Dianetics in the fertile social turmoil of post-war California. Although Dianetics as a social movement blew up in his face fairly quickly in the 1950s, Hubbard was always fast on his feet. Just as quickly, he repackaged many of the same ideas, combining some then popular concepts from psychology, elements of Asian religions, and even seasoned the mix with a little of his science fiction imagination, and Scientology was born. According to one possibly apocryphal version of the story, Hubbard made a bet one evening over drinks with some buddies that he could invent a whole new religion out of thin air and sketched a few of the basic ideas on the back of a cocktail napkin on the spot. Having seen how Scientology used the PMC front organization to gain entry, and get paid to provide management services to their target market of health professionals, it remains to be seen how that entry point could be translated into actual attempts to recruit new members for the church. 
Scientology not only incorporated pop psychology into the doctrines of the church, but also adopted many of the latest insights from marketing research when they wanted to use their practice management consulting business to recruit new church members. A basic rule for people who have to sell you something that you don't need is first to sell you something that you do need, but to connect it somehow to the other thing they're trying to sell. In this case, they manage the connection by including one particular item among the other instructions packaged for managing the practices of their healthcare professional clients. This item is called the Oxford Capacity Analysis, and the PMC Consulting is the Trojan horse that carries the OCA into the building. Real psychologists who have examined or even taken the Oxford Capacity Analysis completely dismiss it as a poorly designed unscientific and unproven testing instrument. But the PMC consultant pulls it out of the briefcase anyway and sits down with the dentist or podiatrist to explain it. The dentist or podiatrist has trained for years to believe in the value and power of scientific tests, so of course she fills it out. The consultant explains that it is all fine to get the billing straightened out for the practice and get all the patient records in order and take care of the payroll for the receptionists and other staff people, but unless the professional in charge of the operation is also operating at peak efficiency, the true potential of the practice will never be realized. The OCA includes pages and pages of questions about everything you can imagine, over 200 yes-no questions. The average subject is dazed and overwhelmed by the time the consultant feeds the results into a computer to get the readout of the scores. These results, of course, always come back on a chart that looks something like a hearing test with a normal range and a couple of shaded bands across the middle and your scores dragging along the bottom of the page. The consultant will be horrified at how messed up you are, but will try unsuccessfully to conceal the concern. Obviously, we have suddenly located a major threat to the success of your business. It's you yourself. And not only that, your personal life must also be pretty messed up given these frighteningly low scores. The consultant has suddenly managed to create a whole new problem that you didn't even know you had. And it's not some fuzzy talk about sin and salvation. This is based on a real test that you just took and some real scores, really bad scores, marked on a real chart. You have used tests and charts with your own patients so this must be true and it looks serious. What's a podiatrist to do when faced with a chart like this? Amazing as it may seem, the consultant who came in mainly to help you with your bookkeeping and cash flow also happens to have a solution to this rather alarming personal problem you seem to be having with your own life. This answer comes straight out of the religion that L. Ron Hubbard made up back in the early 1950s after his first attempt with Dianetics collapsed under him in Los Angeles. You hold a couple of galvanic skin response monitors in your hands, like John Travolta is doing in a photo from the 1970s, and you talk about yourself. The Scientology person watches your skin reactions on what they call an E-meter, which is supposed to be measuring something about bad habits called engrams that you have implanted in yourself by mistake. The technology resembles a polygraph used for lie detector tests, but what it shows is that you're messed up. And you sit and talk about yourself and a process called auditing yourself. You gradually find out that to get rid of the bad engrams, you have to learn to understand the true nature of the universe and the true way to live effectively in it. This truth, of course, is already published in the doctrines of the Church of Scientology. If you can convince yourself to believe this stuff, your readings on the e-meter start to improve. The goal eventually is to achieve what they call clear, to clear out all those bad engrams and become truly enlightened. At that point, you will find peace, happiness, business success beyond your wildest dreams, better sex, a clear complexion, you name it, and it will be yours. Nobody ever actually gets there, but you will finally get yourself firmly pointed towards the true, correct goalposts in life. It would help a lot if you would officially join the Church of Scientology so that you and the other members could help each other along this path. Where might this lead you? 
what does that true reality look like in the pages of the Scientology Bible, which is actually many, many volumes long, even worse than the Oxford capacity analysis. As a religion, Scientology is syncretistic. Syncretism means taking ideas from different sources and fusing them all together into a new combination different from any of the originals. For example, the Sikh religion in India combines key ideas from Hinduism, such as multiple different gods and reincarnation, with key ideas from Islam to make a whole new religion. Consequently, both the Hindus and the Muslims hate the Sikhs as heretics, so Sikhs teach that you always have to carry a knife for self-protection, just in case. Not only does Scientology add in pseudo-scientific gadgets like the e-meter and supposedly scientific personality tests, but these turn out to be mixed together with the religious idea that you are a combination of a mortal, temporary physical body with an immortal, intangible spirit called a Thetan. As a Thetan soul, you have lived through many, many other physical bodies before. That is, you've experienced reincarnation, just as described by Hinduism. The difference in Scientology, and here we can see Hubbard's early career writing pulp science fiction, is that some of these prior incarnations didn't even happen on Earth. You have lived previous lives all over the galaxy, you as a Thetan always trapped in some physical body or other. If you could just finally get clear, your Thetan could actually transcend these physical limits and exist independently forever as pure spirit. Not a totally original idea, but a lot of people have been burned at the stake over the centuries for thinking along these lines. So how did you get stuck here on Earth? This may actually be the best part at least if you're looking in at Scientology from the outside as entertainment. You can almost hear L. Ron Hubbard sitting over a beer with his buddies saying, how about this? Do you think they'll even go for this? Apparently, there was this powerful intergalactic dude named Xenu who actually brought a bunch of us Thetans here to Earth. Xenu is no competition to God or anything, but pretty powerful anyway. It gets a little fuzzy about how we got stuck inside all these primates, but here we are anyway, all trying to get clear, if only we could realize it. This syncretistic jumble of personality tests, intergalactic alien rulers, holding onto your e-meter handles while you audit yourself, mysterious intangible Thetan spirits, immortality and reincarnation, all come pouring out of the Scientology doctrines once the practice management consultant gets settled into your dentist's office and gets it running more efficiently. What's good for your business must also be good for your personal life. If this is handled right, you become not only a true believer, but actually an active agent like Tom Cruise, who will take on the task of bringing more people into the light, helping them to get clear. It is particularly interesting that the Church of Scientology does not have any problem with you being a Scientologist and also a Catholic or a Muslim at the same time. There's a little bit of all these established religions salted through the Scientology doctrines, and they are happy to compete on that playing field with the other religions where it's just their word against somebody else's. But it is a very different story when it comes to psychological science. Real psychologists and psychiatrists constitute a deadly threat to Scientology because they may have objective tools and measures available to them that can reveal the pseudoscience of auditing and the Oxford capacity analysis as a lot of baloney. And if that's baloney, maybe the same could be true about you being an immortal Thetan who has been reincarnated all over the universe before Xenu brought you to the earth. That's why we have to learn never to listen to or trust such bad people as psychiatrists. This is a basic operating principle of any cult. You have to convince your members that the only true and reliable information about life the universe and everything is found within your group, flowing from the infinite wisdom of your enlightened leader. Everything else out there is dangerous fake news, and you need to fear and hate it as the threat that it is to your immortal Thetan soul. So be careful out there.